Hello and welcome to Learning Git, our screencast course on the Git version control system. In our last section, we learned about what Git version control is, focusing on the central concepts of distributed control and the different workflows that it allows. Today we'll begin our second section where we'll walk through all the steps of building a Git repository. We'll begin by looking at what occurs when a repository is initialized. Then we'll make our first commit, push our changes to our remote repository on GitHub, and explore some of the options available when looking through the commit history. For our first video in this section, we'll focus on repository initialization. But before we dive in, I want to introduce you to a new friend. His name is Zach, and he just had an idea for a real handy app and has the coding skills to make it happen. But he can't do it all alone, so he's hoping to leverage the open source community to make his dream a reality. Zach has heard of Git's popularity for projects like these and has decided to give it a try. Before he can get the code out to other people, though, he'll need to install Git and initialize his repository. Zach's operating system provides a command line tool for Git through its package management system. If you're following along at home, you may want to pause here and visit the Git SCM website where you can find out how to download Git for your specific operating system. To begin, Zach is going to create a new directory with the name that he wants to give his repository. During development, Zach will refer to his project by the codename Finnegan, which is what he'll name the repo. So let's make our directory and step inside. Now that we're here, we simply use the git init command to initialize. We've just created a local repository that we can use to track our changes. Before initialization, our directory was empty, but if we view the hidden files, we see a .git directory. This contains a number of files that define the current state of our repository. Here we can find information about all the available branches, tags, references, and much, much more. We won't go into the details at this time, but essentially, this is what makes your directory more than just a collection of files. These entries allow your directory to reflect the state of your project at the point of any given commit on any branch in the entire history of the repository. This, of course, does us no good unless there are files to track, so let's begin to explore what happens when we start adding files to our project. Since this will be a Ruby project, our first file will be a Ruby class. Zach's app specializes in solving problems, so the first thing he'll need is a problem solver class. So we'll open up problemsolver.rb, and we'll create a skeleton for one of the project's core classes and save and exit our text editor. Now that there's a brand new file in our initialized repository, it stands to reason that Git should know about it. To see what Git has to tell us about our recent change, we use the git status command. As you can see, the file that we just added is under a section labeled untracked files. When Git detects a file that is not in the repository's database, it will list it here. As long as this file remains untracked, it cannot be committed. Since we obviously want to track this file, let's tell git to do just that with the git add command. Now that we've told git that we want to track this file, let's see if it tells us anything about our new file. As you can see, our file is now in a section called changes to be committed. Any file in this list is located in what's known as git staging area, which contains all the changes that will be made to the repository when the git commit command is used. In our next video, Zach will make his very first local commit while we talk more about the staging area and the Git repository along the way.